Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Natalie Austin Ford. I'm the Texas Director at Alliance for Justice, and I'm uh, joined by that lady in the small little window to my right, Jen Powis, who is our senior counsel at our Houston office at Alliance for Justice Boulder Advocacy. Today, we're going to be talking about how 501c3s and 501c4 social welfare organizations can work together to build campaigns and to pursue their uh, their advocacy agendas. We're going to be here for about an hour. We do encourage you, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Jen's going to be monitoring that as we go through the session. We'll try to tackle as many as we can as we go through the content and then hopefully have a little bit of time at the end as well. But today we're really going to be talking again about these advocacy rules that apply to C3s and C4s to really understand how nonprofits can safely work together when building these advocacy campaigns. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Alliance for Justice, just to give you a little bit of an overview, we are actually a nonprofit organization ourselves, a 501c3 public charity. Also, we are a national association of more than 120 organizations that are all committed to progressive values and to the creation of an equitable, just, and free society. We are advocates for a federal judiciary that advances the core constitutional values and even-handed administration of justice for all Americans. We really want to see equity in the courts and make sure that the courts reflect the diversity of our communities, the diversity of our professions. And we're also the leading authority on the laws that govern nonprofit advocacy. And so many of you might be familiar with our Boulder Advocacy Program. You can check us out at boulderadvocacy.org. But effectively, we are here here as a resource. We offer free technical assistance, free written legal resources, workshops to help you build your advocacy capacity as a nonprofit organization and also to help you understand the rules that apply to your campaign work, to your political work, to your social justice, your public charity work so that you can be as bold as possible while staying within the confines of what the law allows. Now with that, I have to uh, give a little bit of a disclaimer. I am a lawyer. Jen is also a lawyer, but we are not your lawyers, so we can't give any legal advice on today's session, but we're here and very happy to help you navigate these rules, navigate the realities of what it looks like to work alongside different types of nonprofit groups. And again, encourage you to ask questions, but just to give you a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going today, I wanted to start with an agenda. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to compare different types of nonprofit organizations and the advocacy activities that each type can engage in. Because again, if you're working in coalition to try to pursue a policy agenda to try to advance your organizational mission, then you need to understand what hat you're wearing and you need to understand the rules that apply to your nonprofit. So again, we're going to start with that real basic comparison of nonprofit types and permissible advocacy activities. After that, Jen's going to walk us through what it means to be partisan versus what it means to be nonpartisan, because what you're going to find out is that 501c3s in particular have to remain nonpartisan. So we'll talk about how you can figure out which of your activities fall into which category. We'll then talk about general principles that govern how 501c3s and 501c4s, other types of nonprofits, can have relationships, how they can work together. And then we'll talk about some best practices for joint activities. Finally, we're going to wrap up with some different scenarios. So we'll kind of look at some real world examples of how this might play out. And again, Throughout the course of the conversation, we'll take your questions and answers. Um, so do feel free to, to ask us questions as we go through. Now, with all that being said, we need to start with this basic comparison of what different types of nonprofits can do. So we have 501c3 public charities. You're going to see a column on your left, which talks about the rules for public charities. We have 501c4 social welfare organizations, 501c5s, 501c6s. We're talking about things like unions and trade associations. Those are reflected in the column in the center. And then on the right, we have a column for political organizations or PACs, sometimes known as 527 organizations. Now, as you can see, depending on which type of organization you work for or which type of organization you are working with, there are going to be different characteristics and rules that apply. 
So starting with that column for 501c3 public charities, these are organizations like the Human Rights Campaign Foundation. They are organizations like Alliance for Justice, the organization that I work for, that Jen works for. These are really unique uh, types of organizations because not only are they tax exempt, but they do also receive tax deductible contributions. So there's this incentive for donors to give to these types of organizations. But in exchange for that incredibly favorable tax treatment, there are going to be some limits placed on how these types of organizations can engage in advocacy. Now, more specifically, these types of organizations are allowed to lobby for legislative change. So if they want to support or oppose legislation, that's something they can do as long as they do so in limited amounts. So they're limited in how much lobbying they can do. And then the one thing they're not allowed to do is that they are not allowed or permitted to support or oppose candidates for public office. And that gets back to this idea that everything that 501c3s public charities do has to be nonpartisan. You can't engage in any sort of partisan electioneering as a 501c3 public charity. Now, that's different than the rules that apply to C4s, C5s, and C6s, groups like the Alliance for Justice Action Campaign, the Human Rights Campaign, SEIU. These are also tax-exempt organizations, but they don't receive those tax-deductible contributions, so they can actually do an unlimited amount of lobbying. They can do exclusively legislative activities if they choose to do so. And they're also allowed to support or oppose candidates for public office as long as it's a secondary activity of the organization and not the primary activity. Again, if you keep going down the spectrum, you have PACs even further uh, off to the side on this chart, these 527 political organizations, groups like Emily's List, tax exempt, but don't get tax deductible contributions. And these groups exist almost primarily to support or oppose candidates for public office or to engage in those partisan electioneering activities. So again, we have this spectrum of nonprofits, each type allowed to do different types of activities. But what we really want to focus in on today is how these groups can work in coalition. And that's why we all have to understand the rules that apply to each type of organization. But that public charity bubble, that's the most restrictive in terms of nonprofits. It's actually a little bit more restrictive for private foundations, but we're not going to touch that today. We're really going to focus on this public charity 501c3. But again, they are allowed to lobby as long as they stay within some lobbying limits but they are not allowed to support or oppose candidates for public office. So what does this look like in the real world? Well, it means that 501c3 public charities can do a lot of different types of advocacy. Everything in green gets the green light, <laughs> so to speak. And that's something that you could do an unlimited amount of as a public charity. So you could engage in research, litigation, training, nonpartisan voter education. You could educate your legislators about issues that you care about as an organization, influence regulations, influence rulemaking, influence corporations, engage in administrative and executive branch advocacy. Again, everything in green is something you could do an unlimited amount of as a 501c3 public charity. Your yellow light is going to be lobbying, which is that legislative work. So support or opposition of legislation. You are allowed to proceed as long as you clear the intersection, as long as you stay within your lobbying limits. But again, that red light is going to be partisan political activity. So everything you do as a 501c3 has to be nonpartisan. It can't be geared towards supporting or opposing candidates for public office. Now, that's a little bit different, again, than the advocacy rules that apply to C4, C5s, and C6s. As you'll notice on this one, C4, C5, C6s, unions, trade associations, social welfare organizations, they can actually do an unlimited amount of legislative work. They can also do every type of activity that public charities are allowed to engage in, in unlimited amounts. And they can do some partisan political activity. They can do some support or opposition of candidates, as long as that's a secondary activity of the organization and not the primary activity. So certainly less than 50% has to be put towards that partisan political work. Some are more comfortable with a 40-60 split, for example, 40% being partisan, 60% being nonpartisan. But again, more flexibility for C4, C5s, and C6s. Important to know if you're working in coalition so that your 501c3 partners are protected because again, your 501c3 partners are not going to be permitted 
to engage in that partisan work. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Jen here because I've, I've mentioned several times that we have to keep things nonpartisan if we're going to have a coalition of C3s and C4s, for example. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be partisan versus nonpartisan? How can we tell if an activity has crossed the line into being a partisan activity that's not going to be okay for C3? So Jen, can you kind of give us a little bit of a guidelines in terms of how we can figure out what's partisan versus nonpartisan? Absolutely. And that's why we wanted to start with the description of the different types of organizations. Because the key here when working in coalition between 501c3 public charities and C4, C5, or C6s is that the C3 has to be protected in some way um, so that it never appears as if it's becoming partisan in its communications or its activities. Now, one of the easy examples to give, right, is that the 501c3 public charity could never endorse a candidate. And so many of you uh, in today's presentation, perhaps you've seen a 501c4 social welfare organization come up with a slate of candidates, endorsing a variety of candidates. That's the area where the public charity, the 501c3 organization, could never go, even uh, implicitly, meaning that it somehow compared its mission to that of the candidate's mission and somehow leaned into that race in an inappropriate way. What's a little bit more difficult is when there are other circumstances, other communications, where it seems as if the 501c3 is in fact becoming partisan. And, and how do we determine that? But unfortunately, all we have from the IRS is what's called the facts and circumstances test. And Natalie, if you can go to the next slide, that's, that test looks at a variety of different partisan factors or nonpartisan factors to try to determine whether or not the 501c3 public charity has routinely engaged in policy-related communications um, so that it has, in fact, inoculated itself against some sort of argument that it's suddenly leaning into a race inappropriately. And so if you look at the screen, um, these are not the only factors that the IRS has said it would look at when looking at a facts and circumstances analysis for communication. But uh, there's some good examples here about whether or not the communication by that public charity uh, is, for example, a wedge issue in a race. Um, and if it's a wedge issue in a race uh, and the public charity has not had a long-term communication strategy around that wedge issue and suddenly starts to pipe up right before an election, for example, uh, that may lean against the organization. It may look a little too partisan. Um, I often give the example of last year's presidential election. Let's say there was an organization focused on uh, kids' health or protecting families uh, in some way. And in October, suddenly, it started talking about how building a wall along the Texas border, since Natalie and I are both based in Texas, would uh, hurt families, be detrimental for kids, and that building a wall is a bad idea. Well, if that organization had never talked about immigration before, if that organization had never really addressed anything going on in Texas before and suddenly started utilizing that type of language before a major election where building a wall was a wedge issue, for example, that is kind of a clear partisan factor that would look um, like the public charity was leaning into a race, becoming partisan in a way that was inappropriate for the public charity. Now take that similar example. And let's say, in fact, the public charity was an immigration organization that routinely talked about how building a wall was a bad idea and that America was formed uh, by immigrants since its very beginning. Um, that type of inoculation, because of that campaign around how it supports immigrants, how the idea that the public charity was engaged in uh, strong policy uh, advisories around what it wanted to see from an administration, well, if it started talking about the wall in September, October, it doesn't look as partisan for that organization, right? That organization always had communications around immigration, always talked about different policies or aspects of immigration. Um, and so this is why the facts and circumstances test is so difficult when we're talking about how we determine a 501c3 public charity needs to stay nonpartisan. And next slide, Nat. 
Um, so we often talk about the facts and circumstances test as being a risk assessment for your own organization. It's not going to be a clean black and white decision for most organizations. They're going to have to determine what they're most comfortable with saying during an election season to determine whether or not the 501c3 public charity wants to stay far away from that line of partisanship or get up as close as possible to it. But when working with a 501c4 organization, it often becomes even more important because there's so much overlap that the two organizations can do together. Remember the primary purpose for the 501c4 organization uh, can be lobbying, policy activities, education, getting to know the legislators, doing nonpartisan GOTV work, all of those same things that the 501c3 public charity could do. But the 501c3 public charity cannot go into that partisan space with the C4. And so next slide. There are some circumstances that are just so clear cut that really the 501c3 public charity has to sort of separate itself, even when working in coalition with the C4s, separate itself from those types of activities because they're just too partisan. We know it's going to be a facts and circumstances test. We've tried to talk to you a little bit about the nonpartisan facts and the partisan facts. Um, but regardless, because the 501c4 can in fact become partisan, could endorse candidates if it wanted to, could uh, pipe up on different wedge issues right before elections, it's important that the 501c3 public charity recognize that and know when the activities have just gone a little too far. And so you'll see here on, this, on the screen some of those secondary type of activities that are more partisan that the 501c4 social welfare organization could do, but the 501c3 public charity could not. Things like the candidate pledges or criticizing candidates quite robustly coming uh, up close to an election time and, of course, endorsing candidates, which is what I've mentioned before. Uh, now, Natalie, how about the next piece? Yeah, well, and I wanted to point out on this slide, too, because there's one that has an asterisk. So I thought I might uh, just explain that, and that's contributing to candidates. So making an actual campaign contribution to their campaign, giving money, goods, services to a campaign. Of course, on the federal level, if you're talking about federal candidates, corporations, which include nonprofit corporations, so C3s, C4s, C3s couldn't do it regardless because they can't engage in partisan activity, but C4s specifically... You want to avoid making contributions to federal candidates because that's going to be a violation of federal election laws. But similarly, at the state level, if you're talking about state or local level candidates, you really need to look at state law to find out if you can make contributions because most states fall in line with those federal election rules and will also prohibit contributions to candidates. But that's going to be on a state by state basis. And so I just wanted to explain that real quick, because, again, that's that little asterisk next to contribute to candidates. But again, the the basic overview here is right is that 501c3 public charities can do a lot of different things, but they can't do partisan activities. 501c4s can do partisan activities like making candidate endorsements as long as it's secondary. But this all becomes really important, especially when looking at how 501c3s, how 501c4s can work together to achieve shared policy objectives. Shared and Natalie, before you go forward on that, we have a great question from the audience sure. asking about how sometimes organizations ask sitting elected officials to support a particular bill and will ask right. them to sign a pledge to support the bill. But what happens when that elected official is in fact a candidate uh, and the organization is asking that person as a sitting elected official, as an incumbent, mm -hmm. to sign in support of a bill that perhaps is making its way through Congress. I think that's a perfect example of, of a situation where we would need to apply the facts and circumstances test. So again, as a general rule, asking candidates to make pledges is going to be prohibited partisan activity for a 501c3. What we're talking about there are the types of pledges where you say, if you're elected, will you agree to do this? Will you agree to do X? Um, those are not going to be permissible for 501 Now, if on the other hand, you're trying to get an elected official to agree to do 
some sort of legislative action. This is a sitting elected official who can make those decisions right now. Perhaps there's even a legislative session that's happening and you are trying to get them to support or oppose a bill that you might take a position on. You can certainly talk with them. You can certainly work with them, try to convince them to support that bill, to oppose that bill, if that's what the case may be. But what you don't want to do is ask them to pledge to do something if they get elected, because then you're all of a sudden tying that issue advocacy, that legislative advocacy with electoral advocacy. And so what you would want to do is focus on the, assuming you're a C3, right? Focus on the legislation, focus on their position, their existence as a sitting government official, and do not mention the fact that there's an election coming up. Do not mention the fact that they are a candidate. Make sure you're talking with other legislators as well, asking them the same types of questions, asking them to also support or oppose the legislation, even if they're not up for re-election. Because notice if you only focused on the ones who happen to also be candidates, that would look like maybe there was some sort of election related motivation behind that action. But again, that's something that that would really require an intensive facts and circumstances analysis so that we could figure out where it sits on that spectrum of risk. And this is actually a good time to point out too, we actually have a free technical assistance hotline. Hopefully, Jen, I don't know if you can drop the number and the email address in the chat, but we have lawyers on staff, although we can't be your lawyer, lawyers on staff five days a week during normal business hours to help answer these types of questions. And so if you want to run a particular scenario by our team to try to figure out whether there are any major red flags to try to figure out whether it's a C3 or C4 safe activity. We can help you navigate those questions in more detail, go into more of the facts and circumstances on that 101 conversation. Um, and so that's something that I might recommend for that. And now <laughs> just and before you go on, I want to just mention too, because um, again, if you are meeting with a sitting elected official and asking him or her to agree to vote yes on the bill, that's lobbying. And so if the right. rules around lobbying are new to you, uh, this we like to think about this presentation as our sort of 301. This is pretty advanced when C3s and C4s <laughs> are working together in coalition. Um, but always reach out to us for our advocacy and lobbying 101 uh, around um, what is lobbying for a 501C3 public charity, because it's so important that public charities use their ability to really go after systematic change by using all of those lobbying pieces that they can, as long along with that strong advocacy. And that's also a great, that 101 presentation is also a great way to figure out how to measure your lobbying limits as a C3. And so that's definitely a good pointer there. But again, you know, kind of advancing it beyond that, talking about how, how C3s and C4s can work together, you know, with each other or potentially with other types of groups like C5, C6s, PACs, one of the things that we like to talk about as a general principle is what we call our uphill downhill rule. And the idea is, again, C3s are not allowed to engage in partisan electioneering. They have to make sure that all of their resources, all of their activities are used in a nonpartisan way. In other words, they can't be giving their resources to C4s and C5s so that they can then be used for partisan purposes, because that would jeopardize the tax exempt status of the C3. And so what this slide basically tells us and what this rule basically tells us is that it's going to be a lot easier when working in coalition, when working with affiliated organizations to transfer resources downhill from a C4 to a C3 than it is to transfer resources uphill from a C3 to C4. So if you think about jogging, if you think about riding a bike, a lot easier to go down than it is to go up. And again, when we're talking about C3s, if they want to share their resources with a C4, they have to put firewalls in place. They have to put kind of understandings and agreements in place to make sure that none of those resources are going to then be used for partisan political purposes. Now, C4s, because they are allowed to do everything that C3s can do, C4s could potentially just give a grant to a C3. They could potentially just give cash to a C3 because there's nothing that the C3 could do with that money that the C4 would be prohibited from doing itself. And so a lot easier, again, to transfer resources down from a C4, C5, C6 to a C3 than the other way around. Another general rule that we often talk about is the shadow rule. In other words, when you join a coalition, when you are working for affiliated organizations, so for example, Alliance for Justice has the Affiliated Alliance for Justice Action Campaign, 
you always need to understand that your shadow follows you into whatever work you're doing. And so let's say that there's a coalition. There was one here in Texas recently that was trying to get a bond passed to help raise funds for public schools in the area. And there was a coalition that came together that had a lot of C3s, a lot of C4s, other types of organizations that were involved as well. But every single organization that was part of that coalition needed to understand that its shadow followed it into that coalition work. And so just because a C3 joined a coalition that also had C4 partners does not mean that it somehow then gets to reap the benefits of the rules that apply to C4s it still has to follow the C3 rules. And so you are always gonna have that shadow following you. You're gonna to have to make sure that any coalition, any joint activities that you do with different types of organizations, you are complying by the rules that apply to your organization. And if you have a blended coalition working towards one shared policy objective, one shared policy goal, everything that coalition does, if it's being done in the name of all the coalition members, needs to be C3 safe. Otherwise, you could potentially jeopardize the tax exempt status of your C3 partners. And so, again, your shadow is going to follow you everywhere. And it's easier to transfer resources down to a C3 than it is up to other types of organizations from a C3. But we've got two more general principles. And, and Jen, I'm hoping you can walk us through those. That's right. Because when you're working in coalition between a 501c3 public charity and a C4 social welfare or C5 union or C6 trade association in some way, you really want to document it. Now, I know Natalie and I are both lawyers, so of course we're going to say you need a written agreement. Uh, but at boulderadvocacy.org, we have some great sample agreements, including a coalition checklist that provides uh, sort of basic rules of the road for protecting the 501c3 public charity when it's working with organizations that don't have the same types of restrictions around that partisanship. Now, that's not to say that every coalition has to worry about becoming partisan. Many 501c4 social welfare organizations uh, can be formed to, for example, simply initiate a ballot initiative um, or perhaps just engage in lobbying and education. Uh, it doesn't mean that the 501c4 will always engage in partisan work, but the 501c3 public charity, because it has that restriction, needs to be incredibly mindful when it is sharing uh, any of its resources, when it's sitting at the table with different types of organizations. And we think, from Boulder Advocacy's standpoint, that uh, thinking through some of the scenarios, writing down your operating agreement, writing down how you're going to uh, share the list of names that you all generate, you know, document, document, document this relationship. It's going to help protect you in the long term. And then finally, kind of, kind of a, a CYA, right, <laughs> Jen? Yeah, you, absolutely. You, that, that's you right. ever get called out, <laughs> you've got the paperwork to back yourself up. <laughs> that's exactly right. And so often, right, coalitions come together a little bit informally. Uh, coalitions don't necessarily create their own brand. Instead, they speak with the brands of everyone that's been sitting around the table. And so because the C4 organizations don't have the same sort of restrictions on what they can say, um, it's just important for that 501c3 public charity and the staff of the organization to recognize that it needs to be mindful of protecting its brand, making sure that it stays nonpartisan throughout all of the communications. So the fourth rule for what we have when we talk about coalitions uh, between 501c3 and 501c4 organizations is to always know what hat you're wearing. Many organizations have an affiliated structure, meaning that the 501c3 and 501c4 share the same brand. And in fact, it is permissible to share employees, websites, email address, et cetera, so long as you followed rule number three, which is document, 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 and your back office is taking care of it. Um, but it's also important that you create some sort of compliance or governance structure uh, to advise the staff when they're playing in what uh, space, right? So what hat is that staff having on when they're working in an affiliated structure between 501c3 organizations and C4 organizations? So those were our basics, right? Those were the general rules, the different types of nonprofits, what the different types of organizations are allowed to engage in depending on their tax exempt status. So now we wanted to get into some specifics about specific activities, joint activities 
that you could potentially work on together with a blended coalition of different types of nonprofits and kind of walk through some of the considerations to think about with each of these types of activities. And so our first activity that we're going to talk about is lobbying. Again, 501c3 organizations are allowed to lobby, specifically public charities, right? Public charities are allowed to lobby as long as they stay within lobbying limits. C4s can do an unlimited amount of that work. What is lobbying? Again, refer back to our 101 training if you need help with that. Uh, email us at advocacy at afj.org and we'll help hook you up with one of those trainings at some point in the future. But effectively, lobbying is supporting or opposing legislation, right? So it's all that legislative work you do to try to get bills sponsored, to try to get bills passed, to try to get bills defeated. Any of that work that you're doing on the legislative level, it's possible that it's going to count as lobbying. So you need to track that and stay within your lobbying limits as a C3. Now, again, C3s and C4s are both allowed to lobby for or against legislation, C3s in limited amounts, and C4 in unlimited amounts. Again, C4s could engage in lobbying as its primary purpose activity, and that's what many C4s choose to do. But one of the things to think about is that if you're working in coalition to achieve a shared legislative goal, um, so for example, the coalitions that have formed in Texas to try to defeat some of these horrifying voter suppression bills that we saw come up in regular session and in special session is that, you know, again, C4s can do an unlimited amount of that work. And so if you have C3s in the coalition who are coming up close to their lobbying limits, in other words, they've already done a lot of that legislative work this year and they might get close to that limit and have to kind of slow it down so that they aren't, you know, risking their tax exempt status. So they aren't in jeopardy of exceeding their lobbying limits. Well, then you can shift that legislative work to the C4s because again, the C4s can do an unlimited amount of it. And so as the C3s get closer to those limits, shift the work to the C4s so that they can start taking over and being boldly, um, being boldly and aggressively in favor of or in support of the legislation that you're working on. What you want to do if you're in coalition on these, though, is, is to focus on the policy issues. So, you know, don't focus on how the lawmakers might be up for reelection. Don't talk about voting for lawmakers now or potentially in the future based on their votes on bills. Because, again, you got to keep all these joint activities nonpartisan. And so what you want to do is when you're working in a joint coalition, C3, C4s, other types of org around the legislative issues, don't align your policy positions with those of candidates and political parties. Also, don't align your policy positions and talk about your policy positions in conjunction with a discussion about the election. Ballot measure advocacy is another type of advocacy that you could potentially engage in as a joint coalition. Now, for those of you who have done our 101 trainings in the past, you'll know that ballot measure advocacy is actually also a lobbying activity because ballot measures are legislation. So if you support or oppose a measure, you're engaged in direct lobbying um, in terms of your lobbying limits as a C3 or that unlimited activity as a C4. But again, joint coalitions need to keep that work nonpartisan. So what does that mean? It means that as a coalition, as long as your C3s are within their lobbying limits, you can circulate petitions, you can endorse measures, you can oppose measures, you could do a signature gathering campaign, you can tell people how to vote on the measure, vote for or against this measure, but you can't take a position on the candidates that might also be on the ballot. Again, this is a lobbying activity, ballot measure activity, so you got to stay within your lobbying limits as a C3, but it is something that you could do jointly as long as you're focusing on the measure, as long as you're focusing on the issue and not the candidate positions on that issue. And as long as you're focusing only on the measure and not also suggesting who people should vote for on that same ballot. So partisan facts and circumstances would be aligning the organization's position on a measure with a candidate or political party, targeting your outreach, your GOTV ballot measure work, so to speak, on how you think certain neighborhoods are going to vote in the election in terms of what types of candidates they prefer. So do nonpartisan targeting, make sure you're not aligning it with candidate positions. But again, that's something that you could do jointly as long as all of the coalition's activities are nonpartisan in that ballot measure context. Uh, here's an example. It says, Bernie says, vote yes on, on ballot measure 61. Um, unfortunately, that is not going to be C3 permissible, again, because you're aligning the candidate. 
um, with the uh, position on the measure. This was back when he was running. And so again, make sure that you keep it nonpartisan if you're engaging in a joint coalition activity, but lobbying ballot measure activities are things that you can do jointly. Um, and of course, uh, we've got some more activities as well. And, and one of them is list sharing. You wanna walk us through that, Jen? Absolutely. And so some of the benefit of working in coalition with others, right, is that you're increasing your power. If we're representing more than one nonprofit in the room, we've got lots of additional capacities, perhaps different skill sets, uh, and we all bring different strengths to the table. Uh, and when working in coalition, we can share our lists. But again, we have to keep in mind those four general rules of the road that we talked about that it's easier to go downhill from the C4 to the C3 as opposed to uphill, et cetera. And so in a joint activity, when we're working in coalition, the C3 organization can in fact share its list with the C4, but remember that that list is a thing of value uh, and that that list has a shadow um, that can't be used for partisan purposes down the line. And so if there's joint activities with the coalition, for example, let's say you're tabling, perhaps if we were all in person, we could have seen some tables at this event. Um, you would have, again, a documented relationship, perhaps saying that we'll table together as a coalition, and then all the organizations that are part of this coalition will share all of those names, and we agree to only contact those names one or two times, et cetera. Uh, in the materials that we'll be providing, again, that coalition checklist, we actually have a great sample list sharing agreement for working in coalition between the two organizations. Again, to make sure that you're protecting that 501c3 public charity from any argument or accusation uh, from the opposition that you've suddenly become partisan. So besides this sharing. But the C3 could also, I mean, if they wanted to, they could sell a list to a C4 or, or rent a list, right? They've just got to make sure they're paying, or that the C4 is actually you know, paying for that, right? That's absolutely true. But then that list also has to be available to anybody that asks for it. And so uh, it's not as uh, frequent, let's say, perhaps, um, that that relationship, particularly if the organizations are just coming into coalition for one big push, uh, sometimes it's easier to generate the new list um, on this new activity, for example, with a ballot initiative or something like that. But Natalie, you raise a great point. The, there's things of value that the 501c3 public charity owns that it can uh, open up for sale or rent to anyone that asks for it. And that could include other things of value too. So for example, databases or research, that type of thing. And so if, if you've got a question about that, if you're wanting to share something C3 upwards, give us a call and we can help you troubleshoot that a little bit. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about getting out the vote, right? This is a standard and uh, important piece of every 501c3 public charities mission uh, and is will has to remain nonpartisan, meaning that uh, in no way could the 501c3 public charity tell anyone who to vote for or to recommend a certain way to vote. Um, this makes a lot of sense, and we see this oftentimes um, uh, whenever an election season comes out, because from an educational uh, position for a public charity, right, getting out the vote, uh, no matter how they vote, is actually incredibly important. We just want a strong civic engagement culture in our communities. Uh, and so getting out the vote will always be permissible for coalition works uh, the, when the organizations are working together, along with just the 501c3 public charities. Uh, but let's again say if we're working in coalition with the 501c4, the public charity needs to be mindful that that C4 may have a candidate slate, may have endorsed particular candidates, uh, and that the 501c4 organization could in fact do more partisan uh, activities around getting out the vote perhaps identifying certain precincts or door knocks, et cetera. That's where the 501c3 public charity can't go. And so it's important, again, while these are types of joint activities that organizations can work in coalition and do together, the 501c3 public charity always has to keep in mind the restrictions around its activities. Um, and we're not always just worried about the IRS, right? And I think, Natalie, you and I were talking a little bit about this recently. Um, there's a problem around reputational harm. If it looks like the public charity has strayed too far partisan, it could be around uh, your ability to raise dollars um, because your reputation could be harmed if it looks like the public charity is in fact leaning into a race inappropriately. 
Uh, but back to this getting out the vote pieces. Uh, here we go again with the red light, yellow light, green light analogy, because while general get out the vote activities will be nonpartisan, right? So the bun on the bottom, you know, vote, it's easy. Come out to vote, you know, learn how to vote here, et cetera, all that type of language. That's always permissible for coalitions um, or for 501c3 public charities. Once we start uh, comparing the mission of the organization with how we want someone to vote, uh, that gets much trickier. Um, and in fact, we know from the IRS that encouraging people to vote pro-choice, you see there with the red dot, right, is too partisan. That has been determined already that that's an automatic uh, partisan analysis for an organization to say vote pro-choice. It would indicate which candidate uh, the person should vote for. And so this would be a prohibited activity for 501c3 public charities to go into. Now, the yellow bucket um, makes me quite sad uh, as an active environmental um, advocate. Uh, vote for climate, you know, uh, vote against climate deniers, for example, or vote the green ticket, things of that nature. Well, that's getting into some risky conversations for a 501c3 public charity when conducting its get out the vote activities. Again, because it looks as if the 501c3 public charity is comparing its mission to that of a candidate's position. And that's what the public charity can't do. So leave that one maybe to your 501c4 friends. Matt? I think another activity we could potentially team up on is redistricting. And I know that in Texas, this is a very hot topic right now. I'm sure that is the case across the US in whatever state that you're working in. But again, if you join in coalition to do redistricting work, you need to make sure that you're doing it in a nonpartisan way. So. What does that look like? Well, it means not referencing candidates and political parties when you're talking about how you think districts should be drawn. It means working towards the general idea of preserving fairness and keeping together a community of interest as opposed to advocating for boundaries that are designed to flip seats or that are designed to save seats for one particular political party. It means to be nonpartisan that perhaps you recommend boundaries that follow existing political subdivisions or natural boundaries as opposed to recommending boundaries um, that are more partisan in other words kind of geared towards getting certain types of candidates elected and it also means being nonpartisan, advocating for compact and contiguous districts as opposed to random sprawling districts that are clearly partisan gerrymandering attempts to maintain the perhaps leading parties uh, lead in a particular state. But again, if you're going to do redistricting activities, if you're going to do them with C3s and other types of organizations or as a maybe just a C3 coalition, got to keep them nonpartisan, talk about fairness, talk about equity, talk about the need to preserve communities of interest, but don't try to flip seats, don't try to maintain seats for certain political parties, because as soon as you start trying to draw the districts in a way that leads to certain outcomes in terms of which candidates get elected, that's when you're getting into a real red light territory for a 501c3 organization. So avoid that partisan redistricting activity. Here's an example, a coalition in Texas called Houston in Action. All of our examples, for the most part, are going to be Texas examples because that's what we know. Um, but it's made up of a lot of different types of organizations. There are some C4s involved. There are some C3s involved. There are some organizations that have affiliated um, are some groups that have affiliated organizations within them. So they have a C3 arm, a C4 arm, a PAC arm, for example. But the coalition as a whole is really all these groups who have come together to strengthen community engagement, um, civic participation in the Houston region. Houston in Action actually retweeted a tweet uh, from a 501c3 here in Texas called the Texas Civil Rights Project talking about fighting for fair maps and the need to testify at a committee hearing. Now, the legislative work that you do is going to be considered lobbying. So if you're in a state like Texas where redistricting is done at the legislative level, you might have to be you know, watching those lobbying limits as well. But again, as long as you're talking about fair maps, as long as you're talking about giving testimony about preserving those communities and really making sure that everyone has a voice in the government that serves them, 
then that's something you can talk about as a C3. That's something you can do in a joint coalition. But again, be really careful because that redistricting is necessarily tied to elections. And so avoid any sort of partisan communications, avoid any sort of partisan messaging, because that would put the C3s at risk. That's right. And so finally, we wanted to address this idea of uh, joint activity being just one website. Um, and with today's world, right, any kind of coalition that comes together, often the first thing they do is they purchase the website, which is absolutely permissible. But again, this presentation has been really focused on an overview of how we protect the 501c3 public charity because it can't become partisan. And so it's important to recognize that if the C3s are at the table uh, with one type or just one joint website, that the C3 shadow follows it to that website, right? That the public charity would be responsible for content on the website and could be responsible for any linked content. The reason why that's important is because, for example, uh, the coalition website couldn't have a direct link to see who our 501c4 social welfare organizations have endorsed in next week's election, right? That is clearly prohibited for a website that is jointly owned by a 501c3. Um, and so there are special rules that are utilized for affiliated organizations. And the example that you see on the screen is actually one from Planned Parenthood where they do a little pop-up window, right? You're leaving the C3 space now, you're going over to the 501c4. Um, and we know from the IRS that that's enough. That sort of break in time between the two organizations is enough. So if you're working in coalition with others and you really want to maximize your voice in some way, uh, and there is some partisan content that you're trying or struggling with how to how to work out in this sort of social internet space, you know, give us a call because there's special rules that apply. Uh, but in general, again, uh, remember those four rules that we talked about earlier in the pr presentation, the uphill downhill rule, the shadow rule, um, and the document, document, document. So, so Natalie, let's talk about some scenarios because yeah. this is actually the fun part, right? Um, and so I'm gonna read out a scenario and then we'll just kind of have a little conversation about it. Um, please remember, we are looking at the chat. If you have a, a question about some of these activities, we're happy to answer them. Uh, and then uh, some of the materials that we've been talking about obviously will also be available for you. But now let's talk about this first one, right? Let's say we have a state that has two coalition of coalitions of progressive groups, one led by unions and very engaged 501c4 social welfare organizations, uh, and it's on redistricting, and they're focusing on drawing lines to enable more Democrats to win seats. But the second table, the second coalition is one that's led by C3s, and it's focused on redistricting education as well and drawing fair maps. Um, but can the 501C3 join both coalitions? I think given these facts and circumstances, right, so given this particular factual scenario, it's certainly going to be okay for the 501c3 to join that C3 coalition that's focusing on fair districts, fair maps, because it seems like that activity is going to be nonpartisan. So I would say absolutely go ahead and join that coalition as a 501c3 public charity. But that first coalition where you have C4s and you have unions, they are, based on these facts, gearing their redistricting activities towards drawing lines that are enabling more Democrats to win. Um, in other words, partisan, right? They're, they're engaged in partisan activities because they're trying to create a map system where it is more likely that the progressive candidates are going to be victorious. And so I would say that given these facts and circumstances, you can join the C3 coalition, but as a C3, you probably want to steer clear of that C4 um, and union coalition that's mentioned at the beginning of the scenario. Right. And we wanted to lift this one up in particular because the Supreme Court a few years ago, right, said that uh, any state could, in fact, use partisan analysis when drawing their own maps. And so it really puts some of the 501c3 public charities in a little bit of a pickle. But let's say we change the facts on this scenario a little bit where we were saying they were gonna form one coalition and that that coalition was gonna work on educating the public about redistricting, right? Cause it's not just your federal seats, it's your state level seats. It could be your school board seats. It could be your city council seats. Redistricting affects, you know, everything we vote for. Um, and that the C3s and C4s were starting to 
form one coalition with this idea that over the next year, they were going to engage in public education, lobbying if that was a, a legislative state where the redistricting maps had to actually go through the legislature, uh, and, and some of these other activities around just working on getting fair maps. What about in that scenario? Can the 501c3 public charity comfortably sit at the same table with the 501c4 organizations? I think in that case, probably. Um, but again, it would we'd have to get into some detail about the exact activities that were going to be happening in that joint coalition. If it is truly education based, it is truly about educating the public about how redistricting works, about how they can chime in in the redistricting process. And it's not geared towards flipping or maintaining seats. It's not geared towards getting certain types of people elected come the next election cycle, then yeah, I think I think that's a scenario where potentially all of these groups could join together as long as the group's objectives, as long as all of those group activities are truly nonpartisan. And so I think that would be a, a, a more likely scenario where we could see a joint coalition with blended types of organizations. So now how about this uh, second scenario? We have a large group of voting rights organizations deciding to join forces to form a coalition dedicated to educating voters about the electoral processes and reminding them to show up at the polls on election day, sort of a basic civic engagement organization. Mm -hmm. The first 10 organizations that join are 501c3s and then a local 501c4 social welfare organization approaches those 10 organizations and expresses an interest in joining. Can the 501c4 become a member of the coalition now? I think yes. I mean, given these facts and circumstances, um, there is no hard and fast rule that says that C3s and C4s can't work in coalition together. In fact, they absolutely can. Again, as long as the coalition's activities are nonpartisan in nature, so they're not geared towards getting certain types of candidates or specific candidates elected or defeated. And so here, yeah, I mean, as long as the C4 is going to be engaged in nonpartisan work as part of that coalition, then it could safely be a member. I think the bigger concern is for the C3s. And so if the C3s are already in this coalition and they're trying to consider whether to bring a C4 on board, they might want to look at that C4. They might want to have some sort of agreement in place uh, to, again, to CYA, so to speak, uh, but to make sure that the C4 doesn't use any of the coalition resources to advance partisan goals, to make sure that the C4 isn't speaking on behalf of the coalition in a partisan way. But yes, I think there are ways that you can have a blended coalition, even talking about voting, talking about voting procedures, the electoral process, as long as those coalition activities are all nonpartisan. So now our final scenario. We have dozens of local nonprofits deciding to hold a rally to protest their state's new abortion restrictions. The rally will encourage attendees to reach out to their legislators and express their opposition to the new restrictions and their support for a change to the law. One of the rally co-sponsors wants to invite a local legislator to speak about the legislative battles to come. If the co-sponsors of the rally include 501c3 public charities and 501c4 social welfare organizations, is that invitation permissible? Can they invite the legislator to come speak about the legislative battles to come? I think yes. Um, in, in most situations, given most of these facts and circumstances. So here we have C3s and C4s. They're going to hold a joint rally to talk about abortion legislation, abortion restrictions. Hello, Texas. This is what we've all been doing for the last few weeks here. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to have a sitting legislator, a sitting executive branch official, a policymaker of some sort, come and speak at your rally about those battles, about their involvement in those battles, about what's happening on the legislative level, about what the potential wins are, what the potential losses are, strategies, legislative goals, that's going to be okay. I think where you get into a dicier situation, though, is is if that person also happens to be a candidate, um, because then you got to you know make sure again if this is a C three C four sponsored event that everything that's said stays nonpartisan. And so, do you have any recommendations? I mean, Jen, I know there is kind of you know there's no general rule that says you can't have someone who's a sitting legislator and also a candidate speak at your event. But are there any tips and tricks that you could offer in terms of you know? what you might want to think about, what you might want to do if that legislator also happens to be a candidate? Absolutely. And this happens all the time, right? Our champions also have to run for a re-election at some point, 
but they might still be our legislative champion. And so we'd want to reach out to have them come speak, not because they were a candidate, but because we'd known them for a while as a being a champion on our issue. And so as long as we're clear with them that they not mention their candidacy, that if they mess up and they say something about it, we immediately step in and give a disclaimer, right? That the 501c3 public charities cannot endorse, that they were invited as a legislator to talk about legislative issues. Um, those are some of the pieces that, again, can protect the 501c3 public charity from some accusation that they were being partisan. And this really ties into a great question that we have about uh, candidate questionnaires. Um, and can an organization during a race push out candidate questionnaires on a variety of topics, local topics, and then publicize whatever those answers are? So what do you think, Nat? I will say, yes, there are ways, and I'm assuming you're talking about C3s Correct. and not C4s, a lot easier for C4s, right? But there are ways that C3s can produce nonpartisan C3 safe candidate questionnaires. There are kind of different guidelines that the IRS has suggested, depending on whether those responses are going just to members or perhaps they're going towards uh, other types of community members as well. But given these facts, we're talking about a publicly distributed candidate questionnaire. Some tips and tricks here. You've got to cover a broad range of issues because if you cover just a narrow range of issues, it becomes very easy for individuals to compare your organization's position on the issue with where the candidates stand. Um, you've not only got to cover a broad range of issues, you've got to invite all of the candidates in a particular race to participate. You can't just pick and choose the ones you think are most interesting or the ones that you might personally want to highlight. You've got to invite them all. The more that respond, the more likely it is that it's going to be safe to publish their responses. So if you know there are 10 candidates in the race, but only three of them provide you with responses, that can become pretty risky to publish those responses because maybe it's the three who happen to like you the most, right, that, that respond and the others decide not to. So you got to look at those numbers, all those facts and circumstances. You also got to make sure you have open-ended questions that you don't imply what you think the answers should be. You have to make sure that you present the answers in an unbiased fashion, that you don't alter the responses in any way, shape, or form. And so, you know, that's just a small list of kind of suggested best practices in terms of uh, candidate questionnaires. We actually have, I think, a fact sheet and a guide called the rules of the game, which goes into a lot more detail about how to make a C3 safe candidate questionnaire. Um, but yes, general rule, <laughs> C3s can do candidate questionnaires as long as they do them in a nonpartisan way. But all those facts and circumstances are going to matter. So take a look at our publications. I'm hoping Jen might be dropping some links in the chat. I can't see it right now. Um, but yes, you know, give us a call, email us at advocacy at afj.org, and we'll be happy to walk you through that particular scenario so that you can make sure that your coalition or your C3 questionnaire is done in a nonpartisan way. That's right. And I just want to lift up, right? Just because they're candidates doesn't mean you can't talk to them. Um, during right. an election process, the nonprofit public charity may want to do candidate education. Reach out to every candidate and tell that candidate who you are, what you stand for, what are the problems you see in your community, and some of the suggested solutions that you have. Um, don't imply that you won't vote for them if they don't agree with you but use it as an opportunity to educate them about what you care about um, and what your community cares about. Um, some of these things are absolutely permissible for the 501c3. And so we wanted to really lift that up uh, at the end there with the candidate piece because the coalition work that C3s and C4s can do together is actually quite a lot. Um, 501c3 public charities can be very bold in their advocacy and their lobbying limits are really quite generous. Sure, we say that that's limited, but what we mean there is that you just have to measure it and report it at the end of the year on your 990 to the IRS. Um, we encourage you to, if you if some of this is new to you, again, please do reach out to us. Um, now we have one more question about how do you evaluate the market value of a list? Back to that list sharing piece. Right. And that is a so tricky question. <laughs> It's harder than you might think, and that's why um, there are actually people who have made professions out of this. And so we recommend that you reach out to a qualified professional list broker because they can look at the quality and the quantity 
of names on your list and the data that you have, and they can actually put a dollar value on that list for you. Um, that'll give you some cover. So as opposed to just you as an individual saying, hey, I think this list is worth $5,000, you'll get an actual qualified opinion on it that you can rely on a lot more safely. And so I would recommend in that situation uh, to reach out to a list broker to figure out what the fair market value of your list might be. Um, but, you know, before we wrap, I do want to mention we have a new podcast. Uh, Jen and I might be a little bit biased because we both happen to be on it. But wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's Apple or Spotify or anywhere else, check out the rules of the game. You can also go to our website, boulderadvocacy.org, to find all of our free written legal resources in our resource library. Again, there's one called the rules of the game, which is all about election rules. But the one that's most relevant for today's conversation is actually called The Connection. And that's about creating and operating and working together with C3s, C4s, other types of organizations and political organizations. We also have some capacity building tools. Um, but I think that, you know, the last thing that I want to mention before we wrap, we're, we're down to the last 30 seconds here. We have offices across the U.S. We have lawyers across the U.S. And we are here to help free technical assistance for any nonprofit, any shape, any size. And so do reach out to us. That number in the center of the screen towards the bottom, 866 675-6229. You can call it right now. And there is someone on call who will get back in touch with you pretty quickly to help answer your advocacy related nonprofit questions. But if you're more comfortable with email, just email us at advocacy at afj.org and we will help you out that way as well. Uh, but with that, thank you all for being here. Jen, you have any final thoughts? No, thank you all. And we hope to hear from some of you soon. Bye everybody.